This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. With us today is co-host Richard Fields. Friend of the show over there somewhere is John Cameron. You, Here I hey, am. There you are, Mr. John. I, I, I fell John, down. I don't know about you, but it's been difficult to breathe the last few days. It's getting better, but what do you think about these fires and how the state has responded? Well, well it's, it's really interesting. John, go ahead. Um, I, I, I think uh, this, the problem is the state is responding. The state isn't planning. Um, you know, the thing to do, there was a, and I wish I remember the guy's name, the, even the, even the, this was in the Sacramento Bee, which is, uh, you know, a little tough on, on anybody who doesn't follow the party line. So they asked a, a couple of experts, you know, what to do. And they were talking about the billions of dollars spent on Cal Fire and the new equipment and the new trucks and blah, 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 blah. And then the guy from Stanford, who's seen as a, a you know, basically a world, um, um, expert on on forestry management said the, the the other side said you know it was the positives about all the fire trucks being added and the fire brigades being added and uh, some of the thinning that they've done you know in in rural areas and and the expert from Stanford said well you know that that's well and good but you're not doing anything to prevent forest fires you're fighting them and the money would be much better spent preventing them. And the only way you're going to prevent them is to actually thin those forests, which uh, strangely enough is what Trump said. And, and, and uh, all the other people, uh, the, the uh, lamestream press said, well, it's not that easy. Well, it actually, it is pretty easy if you could get the Sierra club and some other people out of the way, because they, they've, they've tried to do this many times in the past. Um, and, and the, uh, the, the super eco groups, sue to stop any kind of forest trimming and they're supposedly the people that love the forests yet the fact that there's so much fuel in them is why they burn um and again um i don't know how many times i've said this on the show i wonder if there's a way to search it i don't think so um john muir when he walked through the sierras um talked about their inviting openness and the reason they were invitingly open was that there were no bark beetles because the fires that, that swept through thinned the trees out, uh, got rid of the fuel that was on the ground, and uh, so the forests were healthy, the forests were healthy, and there was a lot fewer trees. And, you know, our, the, the, the ground can only support so many healthy trees, and um, Without fire to clean out the weaklings and help the strong survive and kill the bark beetles, you're going to have this problem over and over and over again. Now, a lot of the current fires are actually brushland fires. Um, and that, you know, what do you do to prevent it? Uh, build a lot of houses on that land and then, you know, you'll have fire service there and you won't have a problem. But, you, you know, I kind of like the open land. Richard and I like to hike. Um, and we have a whole lot more places to hike if... Uh, if uh, fire prevention was and, and healthy forests were the objective of these agencies that are actually tasked by us, the taxpayer, to, to keep us safe. So what they're doing is wait until there's a conflagration and, and, uh, and fighting it. And, um, you know, the, there's some real interesting politics that goes on. Uh, back when I worked for a public interest law firm, I talked to one of the attorneys that had a really, really um, deep understanding of the problem. And he said that uh, anytime there was a fire and, and federal people came in, they would basically not fight the fire. They would just, you know, put down a fire line, retreat behind it, put down a fire line, retreat behind it. And all of the big wigs from all over the country would fly in. So they'd get their danger pay and their per diem and all the rest of that. And and their catered meals, and and they basically did nothing to effectively fight the fire. So, politics, 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 and I'll let somebody else talk now. Well, you know, another another problem is that uh, you mentioned the uh, hard environmentalists trying to prevent harvesting of timber. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, the, the timber companies were allowed to actually own the land that's now Forest Service land or state land or other otherwise publicly owned land, which is most of the forest land in the, in the, in 
the state of California. If they were actually able to own the land and manage it for the harvest of timber, you can bet that they would use practices that does not that would not let that undergrowth uh, accumulate and provide the dry tender. Uh, and and we would also have uh, lower priced housing, lower priced uh, construction of anything that uses uses wood for uh, a building material. Hmm. Um, so you know, so you know, uh, responsible forestry is the friend of uh, forest fire prevention, not the enemy. Uh, it also allows trees to grow much bigger because you don't harvest uh, saplings for timber. You, they're, the only thing they're good for is pulpwood. Uh, you, ha you harvest mature trees, and the only way you can get tall, uh, uh, broad, mature trees is if you let them actually grow for a long time and cut out the underbrush so that they, in fact, can get all of the uh, moisture, whatever is needed to, to, to grow to uh, uh, timber size, uh, harvestable uh, size. Um, the, the, you know, the, the bugaboo, of course, is, is global warming. Now, I'm not here to say that there is or is not global warming. I don't really know. Uh, if there is, whether it's caused by humans or not, I don't know that either. But uh, the, you know, the, the narrative repeated endlessly by the media is that we have warmer weather, which leads to higher temperatures, which uh, encourages fires. Well, that's true to an extent. Uh, higher higher temperatures lower the uh, or make it easier for uh, wood to reach its kindling point. But if you get rid of the fuel, whether it's usually you know most effectively by good forest pro uh, practices, good forest management practices, you you, you eliminate the problem uh, almost entirely. And that's not that's what's not happening. Another wrinkle in this whole thing is that uh, the state uh, fights fires using prison labor. And because of the coronavirus lockdown, prison labor, free or nearly free prison labor is not available this year for to any great extent. So a, the number of firefighters uh, is a lot lower. And to add injury to that, just as an aside, uh, people who are, are prisoners and fight fires and learn how to do it and are actually pretty good firefighters. Once they are paroled, once they get out of prison, they can't get a firefighter's uh, job because you can't get a job as a with a felony record. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Thank you for bringing it up, Richard. There's, yeah, there's a whole lot. I mean, we could we could actually take up about six shows with this, but you know, just one example of the lunacy that's going on uh, after a fire. Uh, the fire damaged timber can be uh, harvested and then used and there's a window of about nine months maybe um, certainly less than a year where you can harvest fire damaged timber and uh, mill it and use it just as if probably a little less effectively than you could freestanding timber that wasn't damaged but it can be done and, and uh, um, you know, lumberjacks, basically timber harvest companies and their, you know, the contract will, will uh, bid on doing this. The bid will be accepted. The, they'll be, uh, well, they'll, they'll put in a bid to get rid of this fuel that's going to be on the ground and add to the mess because it's the fuel on the ground. In many cases, like in Yosemite, there's six feet of fuel on the ground in some places. Um, but before you know, the white man came and interfered with it, it was again that inviting openness. But the problem is that it takes more than the period of the time where the trees will be healthy enough to harvest to get a permit approved to remove the trees. So that's the kind of craziness we're dealing with here. And a lot, of, and a lot of that delay is caused by envir environmentalists who sue yeah. to prevent the the, uh, yeah. the salvage timbering you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's I think that. One of the things that brings up to me is that our firefighters are one of the few groups of government employees, government agencies that still have trust. And I would like to say help. I would not like to see the mismanagement of our emergency services start to erode that trust, even amongst the firefighters. It's I mean, if the firefighters lose our trust, what do we have left? And so with so much distrust in the amongst the population, and that's what I hear out as I'm talking to people is there's just distrust among every level of government except for firefighters and i'm seeing so much of this mismanagement that's got nothing to do with the firefighters is eventually going to land on them like yeah. so many of our other agencies and that i find personally disturbing but as we go back to f cheap labor um catholic schools are looking to win over families with virtual classrooms 
it's I guess as more and more families are looking for other educational options than the kind of out here in Sacramento, it's a mess. The trying to distance learning for Sacramento City, it's a mess. So as other people are trying to learn how to educate their children differently, Catholic schools are looking to fill in the gap. They're hoping more people are going to come to them. Silver lining. Uh, the uh, fact that uh, uh, public schools are closed is giving uh, private schools, uh, Catholic schools included, uh, a great opportunity to uh, market their uh, their product, which is in most cases vastly superior to whatever you can get in in most public schools, unless you live in a really uh, high uh, real estate priced neighborhood like like Davis or uh, whatever it is in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, unless you live in, in a really expensive neighborhood, public schools are 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 are, are not are bad, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, private schools in those neighborhoods or that draw from those neighborhoods, Catholic schools included. Uh, do a, a much more credible job of actually educating uh, kids. And this is giving them a marketing opportunity to step in and, and fill the uh, shoes that are not being filled by uh, our public school educators. Yeah, uh, the, um, I, I agree with everything Richard said. There was a recent article in, in the local Sacramento newspaper um, that talked about, it listed the, the schools and school districts that have asked for exemptions to open. And I think there was like 57 or 58 schools and districts and 55 of them were private schools. Uh, and then there were some of those ritzy school districts that you talked about, Los Altos, I think Campbell, uh, and, and I'm not sure if, it, if Placerville was on the list or not, whatever that district is called. But these are, um, you know, and when you look around, you, when you look around the country, uh, it's, it's black and white. The decision to keep schools closed um, happens more often in districts where the teachers unions are strong, where there either are no unions or the teachers unions are weaker, schools are being opened. And when the teachers unions are strong, uh, schools aren't being reopened. And they're because they're, uh, the teachers union have so much clout, still, even after the Janus decision. Was it Janus decision, Richard? Is that the I one? I think so, yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, apparently membership and dues have actually gone up. So they've, they've done a very good job recruiting, I guess. Um, although in California, the only people that can actually talk to teachers about opting out of their, uh, their union dues are, are, are people who work for the union. They're not allowed to talk to their HR department. They have to talk to the union because the state of California, as usual, wrote a little law the microsecond the Supreme Court decision came down to completely circumvent the law shockingly. So um, it's, it's pretty clear that the, that the, you know, again, any union's job is to take care of its membership, but I think people no, are it's, it's not, it's to take, yeah. it's to take care of its uh, management, the union, the union big ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Employee, well, the, the, union the, big know, ways, the, mem the members yeah. are, 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 are second class and the students are, are like fifth class. Well, they're not, not my grandfather's product. unions. That's for sure. These modern unions, they're yeah. not my grandfather's unions. They're just no. completely and different. Then, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of economic theorists that say, uh, you know, unions get a lot of credit, but I don't know if the credit is due because there is a change in, in people's attitude toward workforce and workers' rights and, and the responsibilities of people in management and company owners at about the same time as the union movement. And I, I think a good case could be made that, that they get credit for a lot of the improvement in, in the work life of people that they don't deserve. But the, the teachers unions especially egregious in my opinion because you know there's their their you know they talk about their passion for education and their passion for the kids and their passion for learning but yeah, but it's obvious what their passion really is which is uh, a really nice retirement package and no risk to them whatsoever in a teaching environment and all of and, that and, well, and, and, uh, and three months vacation every year well and, and more than that um, I think it was Reason did a really good study, or is it Fee, one of them, that said that, you know, they work like 83% of the, the hours that other professionals make at a comparable wage. So they're actually, for the time they work, paid way more than um, people even in executive roles, much less much less management roles. We're talking about executive roles, if, if you add in their benefit and pay package. But uh, I'm not usually a fan of the United Nations but the United Nations basically has come out and said the kids need to be back in school. Um, the the uh, the science, as we know it, about this whole pandemic, 
they don't use the word panic-demic, I do. Um, the the COVID-19 um, shows that, that kids are at infinitesimally small risk of, of getting ill from being in the classroom, that the risk to their lives, their economic viability, their socialization, their mental health, and actually their physical health, they're better off, they're safer in a school environment than they are at home. And that doesn't talk anything about the growth of their little souls and minds, if you believe in souls. Hopefully we all believe in minds. But um, so the UN's done that. Uh, the, in the UK, they looked at the numbers, United Kingdom, and come up with exactly the same conclusion. They said the, the chances of children becoming severely, seriously ill from this thing are infinitesimally small. The only children that have died in the country have had um, uh, from COVID have had um, very serious underlying comorbidities, not minor comorbidities. And unlike the flu, they're not super spreaders. What, the, what they're finding in countries that have kept schools open and open schools, and schools are not a source of a uh, greater number of cases. Um, and you know where, where teachers are going to get ill is not in the classroom. Teachers are going to get ill in the break room with the other teachers. That's where they're at risk. So you know the, the fact that the Catholic schools are stepping up I know, I think it's uh, one of the local schools, St. Francis, they're going to do uh, two out of three days live classroom uh, in shifts so that they can maintain probably an unneeded, although it's high school level kids, not elementary kids, um, social distancing and uh, two or three days will be, I think two days, so they're going to a four day week rather than a, th a five day week they had are going to be virtual. Uh, mm -hmm. And the quality of education, as Richard pointed out, in private schools and the quality of education, which is which is really a kind of another match to the fire for teachers unions around the country, is that homeschoolers outperform people in classrooms, public classrooms, by a huge extent throughout the country, always have. And that's why, uh, and also in charter schools, um, but they're, you know, charter schools are part of the public school system. So you know, the, the politics are, are what's driving this whole thing, um, you know, and, and the teachers unions have gone so far as to say, yeah, we're, we're going to go on strike if you force us to go into the classroom. And before we go back to the classroom, we want universal health care. And uh, well, yeah, they're putting anyway. their entire wish list on going back. Yeah, uh, wish they're... list on going back. It has nothing at all to do with, um, with education. Uh, yeah, they've gone from education. It's what concerns me on this? Blackmail. What concerns this to me on this is we now have a bunch of rich people can now go up and say, or upper middle class can send their people to uh, to private schools, to Catholic schools, but poor people are still stuck because their education money doesn't follow the student, it follows to the system. The student is not as important as the system. And that's my major concern is that we are exposing this, the, the fact that the system cares more about the money from the child rather than educating that actual child. They just want the money. And well, I think we've known that for an, uh, a really long time, but now people are being slapped in the face with it, and that's that's a very good thing. Um, you know, public and again, we could do five shows on public employee unions. I mean, the FDR, who started this, basically the whole socialist America that we're in right now, um, and, um, he flat out was uh, thought that uh, that public employee unions were were uh, an evil that should not exist and for the same reasons that we're we're talking about the problem with them right now because every dime they get every every negotiation they make is political every dime they get is a political decision and um you know those those when the kids are in classroom especially in california they're being taught you know not how to read write and do arithmetic they're being taught social justice and uh green and uh, 16, anti-bullying Hmm? Six, the sixteen nineteen story. Yes, they, they're learning kind of a strange version of history rather than just telling the facts and let them interpret history. But speaking mm -hmm. of history, we're going to go ahead and move on. In the Middle East, there is a historic Middle East deal with the UAE and Israel. I believe was it UAE, Richard? Yeah, United Arab Emirates. Uh, they had basically decided to uh, uh, make nice, become friends, uh, trade. Uh, they're opening their borders between each other. There are flights. Uh, directly between Arab, UAE, and uh, Jewish Israel. Uh, the only people that are losing out on this are obviously the Palestinians who, whose uh, claim to uh, the land they've lived on for millennia uh, is 
continuing to be unrecognized. So mm. the Palestinians are not happy. The Israelis are happy. The United Arab Emirates uh, people there are happy. And 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 in addition to the UAE, Netanyahu is saying that uh, he is in high-level uh, talks with a number of other uh, Arab countries uh, in the Middle East to uh, establish stronger ties. And you got to give credit, uh, a little bit of credit to uh, to Trump for this, for actually brokering some of these deals. Now, whether the United States should be brokering deals in the Middle East is another question, but if they are going to be brokering deals, it's good that the deals that are being made are in the, in the, in the direction of more peace rather than less, uh, as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, well, if nothing else, Trump changed the conversation, the way the conversation was being made, even if he doesn't have direct, you don't want to give him direct uh, credit, but he did change the way the conversation was made. The, you know, the, the pieces on the chessboard got all moved around, which forces people to have a different type of conversation. And so at least, you know, the conversation is moving. And that's kind of what I see as good, whether the deal is good, whether we like it or not, at least the conversation is starting to change. And that's... Yeah, the only other party that's uh, against it is Iran, who is uh, Shia, and the Shia have always hated the Sunni uh, Arab nations, and that that will never change. So they're 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 not in favor of it. But but other all all the way, you know, in, in general, in in the uh, in the interest of creating a more peaceful world, this these uh, developments have to be, uh, I, I think, viewed uh, optimistically. And you mentioned you mentioned Trump's part in it. You know, again, he's a he's a glad hander and a backslapper and a deal maker and a negotiator and you know, kind of a nut. But he, if if uh, if a Democratic president would have uh, accomplished what he accomplished, at least got them talking between North Korea and and South Korea, uh, he would he would be wearing or carrying I don't know do you wear or carry a Nobel Peace Prize I don't know what they look like but you know the um, I don't have one of those so I can't tell you. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. Well, I know they pin I'm, them around I'm, their necks, don't they? I don't know. No, that's that's the other one. Yeah. Never, I have but anyway. No, so there's they mail it to you. You don't know that. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I think. Um, you know, it's like it's like what's happening here between the the Republicans and the Blamecrats. Uh, you know, it's fear-based stuff. You know, they're calling each other names, and and uh, you know, they're they're now. I guess the rumor going around is <clears> is uh, that. Uh, you know, even some Dems are arming themselves because they're worried that Trump won't give up power when he loses the election. So fear, 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 fear. And in the Middle East, it's it's been, you know, the hated enemy and they're different religion and they don't believe the things that we do. And, and if you can foment enough of that and get people crazy enough and angry enough and convince them that, that they are being wrong, that the great evil exists right across the border, then it's much easier to, to step on their civil liberties. It's much easier to keep them under your thumb. And so anything that cuts through that fear and allows people to make, you know, make uh, decisions without the yoke of, of uh, the boot of an oppressive regime is a good thing. And, you know, this is one, one uh, piece of it. You know, if you, if you can get the, the great Satan uh, you know, which is Israel in the eyes of a lot of Arabs out of there and stop focusing on that, then you can uh, turn some of those uh, fighter jets into plowshares. And that's a good thing. I wish we could, you know, give up this uh, role that, I don't know why we assumed it, of, of being the world's policemen. Um, strange policemen we are. And, uh, you know, not spend some of that money and maybe, you know, even if they are going to spend it, spend it on something else, you know, like... Um, Oh, I don't know how strange it is. I mean, uh, cops are pretty good at eating donuts. The Defense Department is pretty good at uh, sucking up goodies oh, yeah. uh, and enriching themselves. So I think there's a lot of parallels. Well, let's talk about well, strange no, policing. All right, well, let's, we can, we've got, we got like three minutes left, so we're, let's move on to get finished. we got want to get Rand Paul in here. The protesters kind of mobbed. I don't even mob Rand Paul, but they were not very kind, so we say, to the very person who was actually trying to get the Breonna Taylor Act passed. It was kind of one of those bizarre scenes we've kind of seen. I, you know, mob mob behavior is an interesting psychological thing. So whether it would, the mob would have gone violent if the police hadn't been there, it's hard to say. So I don't want to... Well, Rand Paul obviously thought that the police saved his, uh, his hiney. Uh, but yeah, you, you pointed out that uh, Rand Paul is the, uh, the author, the, the originator of the uh, 
Breonna Taylor legislation, which would end no-knock uh, raids across most of the, you know, in most in most instances, uh, which is a good thing. And obviously, the people who were uh, remember, you know, say hit say her name, say Breonna Taylor's name. Uh, obviously, they didn't know who they were talking to, or if they did, didn't care. Uh, I think the uh, the you know, given the uh, average level of uh, intellectual. Uh, uh, Knowledge of uh, the average mobster or person who says it. I can see yourself. I can see yourself editing. As you put it. <laughs> <laughs> the proper word there. You know, I'm not thinking job. that they probably uh, probably just saw that he was leaving the Republican uh, 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 convention thing at the White House, and that was enough, uh, and didn't take time to reflect mm -hmm. on the fact that he was actually on their side. Um, well, and, and you yeah, know, the I think what the whole thing we need to remember on this whole uh, the, this whole riot thing is. We need to expect police to do their jobs. Their jobs are to protect property, to protect people from violence and uh, vandalism and that sort of thing. Their job is not to uh, stifle peaceful protests and they've been uh, switching roles. They've been stifling peaceful protests and ignoring the, the arson and the looting and, and the, uh, and the da damage and the killings that people are, are, are engaging in. I'd, I'd, I'd like to, if we can, I know we're, we've got like three seconds left, but uh, on the next show or a show pretty quick, when we talk about uh, in Minneapolis, they have a, a rule on the books that says uh, uh, businesses can't have security do doors down over their windows. And the reason for it is uh, that it gives the appearance that it's a neighborhood. Just to talk about that kind of craziness maybe on the next show. So, um, yeah. Stay, tuned. Stay tuned. It's a teaser. <laughs> it's a teaser for the next show. Well, actually, it wouldn't be the next show. It'd be the show after next because I think we've got a guest for next show. Um, but yeah, this whole weird, we've gotten into a weird space where silence is violence. The wrong words are violence, but violence is peace. And nobody knows what's going on anymore. And we've all kind of lost our sense of. 1984, it just came a few years late. That's all. Yeah, we've all kind of yeah. lost our sense yeah, of humanity. Just, I was thinking 1984 at the same time. Yeah, 1984 yeah. should be a book. Not history, yeah. Uh, I just or not a, I want everybody not a, to just take a manual. break and just relax for a minute and just kind of get your sense of self again. It seems like nobody's thinking, everybody's emoting, and they're so caught up in this emotion that they can't stop and think and say, "Hey, I'm actually violating the very thing." Uh, you know, creating more injustice doesn't solve injustice, hmm. and you know, accepting violence only creates more violence, and we, we're. We want to stop hurting people, not hurt more people. I, ah, the world has gone to a crazy place, and we are out of time. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, John and Richard, for being here. Thank and you, James. Thank you, Richard. You can find everything at libertariancounterpoint.com, or what is it, the, the Libertarian Counterpoint on Facebook. And, yeah, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs> this is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m., Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.